Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, my question's slightly a tangent to today's thing, but I hope you'll kind of consider it anyway. Um, for my logic to understand Christ as the saviour of humanity, because he is all man and all God, mm -hmm. um, therefore I think that credits Augustine's theory of us all being se seminally present in Adam. And I was wondering whether you agreed with that or whether you had a different... Okay, I, I need you to say it again. I didn't quite understand. What about Adam you were saying? Um, Augustine's theory about us all inheriting original sin oh. from Adam. Yes. I think that Augustine must have been right in order for Christ's resurrection to be credited by the Christian faith because surely if he's born all human and we're all born sinful, then there must have been something that set him apart, which was that he wasn't yeah. seminally present, if that's... Yeah. I don't think that's necessary. Not all Christians agree with Augustine's take on original sin, that uh, in Adam, all human beings, all humanity fell. That's not to deny the historicity of the fall, but some would say it's simply through Adam's sin that sin entered the human race, and then as Paul says in Romans 5, and sin then spread to all men because all men sinned. That this is like a, a sort of disease, in a sense, entering the human race and then spreading universally. And Christ's substitutionary atoning death could still be universally valid and applicable for all human beings, regardless of how they came to be sinners. So I don't see this as being essentially connected. I, I think that's an open question as to how you understand the fall and its implications. Um, so whether one thinks that all people are guilty in and because of Adam's sin, or whether you think this is more of a kind of um, contagion as a result of sin entering the world through Adam, I, I think is not essential to understanding the significance of Christ's atoning death on behalf of all persons. Okay, and sorry, I had one more. Yes. Um, you said that you thought the gospel of, I can't remember if it was Mark or Matthew, but it was, um, there were words in it that came from previous traditions. And I wanted to pose the suggestion that perhaps instead of, if you maintain that it was actually the people who are accredited in the name who wrote the gospel, that actually the words that came that aren't, um, <coughs> that don't sound like they're from them, are actually later translations and sort of got a bit mucked up along the way of that. Now, I, I, help me to be sure I understand you. Are you suggesting that the received authors of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not in fact the names of the original authors. Is that what you're asking? Um, yeah, I'm firstly asking that, and I'm secondly asking if they are the people who are accredited in the title. In the what? It, if they are the people who are accredited as the Gospel's titles. Try to? Uh, title. 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 Yes. Sorry. Um, Sorry, I, I, as an American, I, I have to struggle sometimes understanding. We're teaching him English gradually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. And, um, could it be that things that aren't necessarily Matthew like, uh, my very cabbly is not very good, um, is that, could that be later translations of it, if that makes? Uh huh. Well, I, I, the authorship of the Gospels is certainly an open question. Um, the attribution of the Gospels to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John came very, very early, already in the first century. But they, they weren't part of the originals. That, that is tradition, that these are the names of the authors. But you may have noticed nothing I said tonight depends upon the authorship of the Gospels. It could have been uh, Henry and Louise who wrote the, the first Gospels. It, it just, the, the names don't matter. What is important is that one uh, gets back to very early primitive sources for the life of Jesus as opposed to later derivative legendary sorts of accounts. And the, the names of the authors, I, I don't think are really all that important. Now that isn't to say though that there could be extra 
material that's been written in by later translators because we've been able to reconstruct the text of the New Testament with about 99% accuracy. So when you read your New Testament in English today, you know that nine, with 99% accuracy, you are reading the translation of the original Greek words that this, these documents were written in. And that's really amazing. It is, it is the best attested book in ancient history, both in terms of the number of manuscripts and the nearness of those manuscripts to the date of the original writing. So you don't need to worry about additional material having been added to the original. We've got the text of the original, and you can take Greek and, and read the original text yourself uh, so that you're not even dependent upon English translations. Mm -hmm. It's possible and often occurs that people are presented with ample evidence, but look for reasons not to believe. So mm -hmm. I think of uh, the Jews in Jesus' lifetime, they saw all the amazing miracles and they couldn't deny them, so they, they, they sought reasons to explain it and resorted to, he must be demonic, or your uh, lecturer at the University in California coming yes. up with a crazy story about uh, the twin brother, or I think of myself before, whilst, um, I'm a Christian now, but I used to be an atheist, and uh, I spent um, a lot of time trying very hard um, to find reasons not to believe. So my question for you is, what would you say to someone after you've given all the evidence, who has more than enough evidence, but is still trying not to believe? How would you persuade someone like that, like I used to be? Well, now you're asking a question no longer about argument and evidence. You're asking a question about, in a sense, personal relationships and, and uh, evangelistic strategy. And I suppose in a case like that, the thing to do with a person who's heard all the good evidence but who still resists it would be to try to build a personal relationship with that person so that you can overcome that emotional barrier and to, to, to invite him to really open his heart to God and to seek God with an open heart and open mind. Say, God is not going to overpower your will. God is a, is a gentleman and he is going to respect your decision. He is not going to overwhelm you. You need to approach him with openness and humility. And if you do, he will, he will meet you, but he, he won't. He won't overpower you if that's what you're looking for. So I, I like what Pascal said, the French author, he said that, God has given evidence which is sufficiently clear for those with an open mind and an open heart, but which is sufficiently vague so as not to compel those who hearts, whose hearts are closed. And I would tell my unbelieving friend, you've got to examine your own heart to make sure that you're not shutting out the grace and the love of God uh, from you. That would be a tragedy and a, a disastrous mistake but then continue to love and, and build a relationship with that person anyway. I was just talking last night with a fellow uh, who told me most of the atheist students he knows at the university are rather like you described. He said their obstacles to belief are really emotional. But he said, once you overcome that emotional obstacle by showing them that you can be a good friend, an unconditional friend, he said, when that emotional obstacle is removed, he said, suddenly the evidence becomes convincing. It suddenly becomes compelling to them, and they're, they're ready to place their faith in Christ. So there are these emotional barriers to belief that evidence alone won't overcome, but hopefully can be overcome through that personal dimension. Well, Bill, we've run out of questions. I just have one final comment, just like given that you're going to the Sheldonian tomorrow night and might even meet Richard Dawkins, what would you say to his constant jibe that faith is blind faith in the face of evidence to the contrary? I would say that faith is trust or commitment in what one knows to be true and that there is good and ample evidence for thinking that God exists and that God has raised Jesus from the dead, and that therefore the person who accepts Christian faith is moving not against the evidence, but he is moving in line with the evidence. Thank you very much.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think your applause uh, indicates that many of us, I think, feel we've had a very profitable seminar this evening and an opportunity to hear Bill on one of his key subjects and to be able to grill him like this on all sorts of aspects from it has been quite fascinating. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you feel as positive about the evening as I do. Let's say thank you again to Bill.